I'd like to introduce the last speaker, Chase Iron Eyes. He's an American Indian activist, attorney, politician. He's a member of the Lakota People's Law Project and a co-founder of the Native American News website, Last Real Indians. In April 2016, Chase was a candidate for the U.S. House of Representatives in North Dakota's at-large congressional district. Chase. Thank you. Uh, Kola Iuha Ichichia. Uh, it's very, uh, very good to be here. I want to thank everybody for taking the time out of their schedules. Wherever you live, uh, we're all busy. Anybody listening in online, I want to thank everybody who organized here, good friends from ages ago, years ago, who uh, happened to bring all of us together. Thanks uh, to our, our co-panelists. Just, um, we, we couldn't really uh, bring any heavier um, subject for Native American Heritage Month. And, and I really wanna thank the people who brought, who made this all uh, happen. I come from Standing Rock. Uh, sorry. I was, I was uh, born and raised in Standing Rock. Um, my mother moved us there when right after I was born uh, in the Black Hills. I currently live there with my family. We're raising a large family on the Standing Rock Reservation. And we live about 20 miles south of the pipeline. So the pipeline is an international act of aggression. It is a continuing nuisance, a continuing trespass and an immediate and clear threat to the integrity of my children's drinking water. As m probably everybody in this room has seen and knows, uh, Keystone, what we thought was the Keystone XL pipeline spill was actually a pipeline called the, uh, the KX-1. Most people paid attention to the, to the uh, DAPL fight, so you know that DAPL is designed to carry 500,000 barrels, barrels of oil every single day through this pipeline that we fought so hard that 843 people were arrested for, that about three to 400 continue to be criminalized for, and, and I, I don't say that lightly because for us, for us as a, as a, say, a society, or, or we like to call ourselves a civilization from time to time, we like to say that we are humane uh, from time to time as a human family or as a civilizations and as a human family and as a civilization as you know expressive of the anthropocene age we have arms and institutions of law what we call law so the law is just a reflection of human biases human complexes human values their religious traditions, their mythologic traditions, their epistemologies, their worldviews, and so forth. And when we have these arms and institutions which are supposed to be objective, uh, trying to preempt the, the, the claim that certain behavior is righteous and other behavior falls outside the scope of what we consider to be law and order in a, a civilized society. And what that results in is myself and a couple of our esteemed colleagues in the room have been arrested because we stepped outside of that boundary. We stepped right up to that boundary. In all of our lives, there's, there's a boundary line And on one side of the boundary line are 
um, things like capital, things like fear, uh, things like greed, things like, I'm going to throw logic in there too. And may, maybe even our, uh, our rationalism, the rational male gaze that has colonized all of humanity over the course of, you know, three to 4,000 years or, or whatever it is up to this point. Uh, it's pretty clear that a, as a society, we, we, we do know something's wrong. I think that's why a lot of people came to Standing Rock. Not just because uh, young people had, had done ceremonies to, I think, impact and elevate global consciousness. They had reached out to the world and the world showed up. But I think it's because I really think it's because capitalism is running out of excuses. It's running out of lies. It's running out of places to run. Because capitalism, which I'm not opposed to, presumes a couple things. It presumes that, first, first of all, our brand of capitalism presumes that we have dominion over the earth, over all beasts, over all beings, and that we can subjugate those others. And those others have included the female species. Those others have included every other living thing, every entity identified as a Saracen or a, uh, a, a pagan or a heathen or as primitive or as savage or as uncivilized. Capitalism assumes that, it, it assumes the GDP growth myth, that our resources, which, forget capitalism, somewhere along the line, we, we've, sep we've abstracted ourselves, we've separated ourselves. Even if, when, you know, I talk a lot about separating ourselves, you know, mind from spirit, um, human from an interaction with our food, our water, our sacred sites and our cosmos. But, but when you think about the word consciousness, that is a word that, that, that in itself is almost an act of separation in that we can hold ourselves, our conscious selves, separate from nature or, or separate from the universal expanse of divine consciousness. These thoughts, I mean, indigenous, uh, uh, you know, epistemologies or, or indigenous knowledges are as yet uh, undeveloped. When you're talking about John Mohawk and some of the philosophers from, from, from our people, which, by the way, doesn't include women. It does include women, but the, the, what, what's written are just kind of the quotes of most of the male leaders. It's not even their internal discourse, it's just, just quotes. That's where we have to glean like our uh, philosophies from. But rest assured, when I, the more I learn, like I was, um, like these, all these fancy words, consciousness, what's another one? Um, uh, metaphysics is another one. Um, and kind of psychology, I guess, exploring that through what I'll just call Lakota metaphysics for, for lack of a, a better word. We, we sort of have corresponding um, ways, methods of looking within and deciding for ourselves, you know, what the nature of our human experience is. And, you know, universities have, it's, in, it's incumbent upon universities really to, for, and incumbent upon us to reach out to the university community, the academic community, because we, we just, we've, we have been told a lot of, uh, 
I guess, I guess, uh, not lies, but something has happened, a great colonization has happened. I talk a lot about the colonization of, of, you know, indigenous people or the original nations, but the truth is that everybody has been colonized. Everybody was colonized long before, you know, some Europeans happened to land on the continent that we civilized tens of thousands, perhaps a million years before anybody landed here. There, there was a colonization of the mind, of the spirit, and it includes, uh, I don't want to call these culprits, but like it includes reason, okay? For instance, it includes reason. It includes the scientific method. It includes empiricism, scientific supremacy, claiming that other worldviews are superstitious or they lack empiricism, they, they, they lack the ability to repeat the findings. Um, the, this process doesn't have a cosmological foundation to utter or appreciate words such as mini wichoni or water is sacred or water is life. You who are sitting in this room, you who are listening, who when you hear those words or when you utter those words, and you feel a tingle, or you know that there is sacred words being said, or maybe you showed up at the pipeline fight yourself, or you watched online. Those of you who are still tuned in, are still here, you're still with us, you're still in the breath, and you're alive. You survived colonization. Because colonization didn't just happen to us. That's what they want you to think. Because in that process, you can kind of, I guess, otherize or you're in the subject group. The subject group that is making a, a spectacle or a specimen or treating another group as an object. And that's, that's a dangerous place to be because you are effectively asleep then. And we all run that risk. We all run that risk. Um, I better give an update about my legal fight real quick. I, I you know. <laughs> um, it's been a long time since I spoke in front of people too. I, I like, miss this feeling. It's a good, nervous, anxious <laughs> feeling. And maybe I need that. Maybe there's something going on with me. Maybe I'm seeking something. I need to decolonize a little bit. Um, but right now, as you, as you know, there are 843 people have been charged. There are people still facing criminalization. It's extremely important that we compel North Dakota, Morton County, we put moral pressure on them, we put all the pressure we can on them to drop every single charge that they wrongfully continue to maintain. They are, they are charging me with a felony of inciting a riot, this is a clever way that they, they're going to do this to a lot of protesters. They're trying to quash dissent. They're trying to institute the chilling effects. They're trying to instill fear so that we don't stand up. But you can hear in our voices that we're out of time. Right now, if I don't figure out a way to make sure that when the pipeline spills at my homeland, my children don't have to leave their homeland. We need to figure out how to procure clean water right now for the Standing Rock and Cheyenne River Sioux Nations. That's, that's, that's order number one that we've got to do, and we've got to keep every single water protector out of jail. This is, when I say the front line is everywhere, I really mean this. Wherever we have a chance to assert ourselves, and if it's signing a petition, then it's signing a petition. If it's donating whatever, whatever you can afford to whatever cause you want to donate it to, then it's that. If it's liking, sharing, retweeting, becoming engaged, 
then it's that. Because we don't, we don't have the resources to fight this fight how we could fight it. So when we go to the front line, that's the last thing. Our brothers and sisters who are going to the front line, they've, they've reached a point in their lives where they, they are out of time. There is no more contemplation. There is, there, is, there is no more. They just go there and they're ready to die there. They're ready to leave their lives there. In a, a selfless act of compassion on behalf of sacred water, on behalf of humanity, on behalf of our lands, on behalf of the sacred sites and our connections to the cosmos. This, this is what we are still here protecting. It's, it's, it's truly amazing, really, when you think about it, that those who were billed as primitive, as savage, as uncivilized, are still here, still standing after every genocidal, holocaustic, um, spiritual, mental, and cultural attempted usurpation. It, they try to take that from everybody. They try to steal everybody's sacred. And you, only you can reclaim that because even though that happened to us and we stood through that, we took that. And you can, you can tell it. We, we breathe a fire, but that fire invites the healing rain. And through that exchange of truth, really, is the only way we're going to be able to concile in the first instance, even before reconciliation. We, in the first instance, have to concile, have a, a meeting of the minds, not what has happened over the last 500 years, for, or for if you're a young American, I mean, if you're, you consider yourselves to be American, and when I, when I say young American, America is 244 years old. It's very, very young. So is Canada, and we are the original civilizers. We are the hosts, and it's time that we showed up at the table. And we'll continue to do that in the spirit of goodwill, in the spirit of compassion, and we want to meet like spirits on the other side. So thank you for your time. Thank you, Chase. What I'd like to do is for the panelists to please come up and uh, sit here in the front because we're going to transition into our question and answer time frame now. And please come up and uh, sit there. And we're, what we've done is, is go through a web base. This is to allow those both in the audience as well as those participating online. Um, again, it is. Um, doing it through pigeonhole.at with the password is water. And what I'm doing here as moderator is going to read some of those questions that have come up. You'll also get to vote on those questions as you vote. It'll transition through. And this is one of the first one that received uh, some of the top votes in there. And it is to all the panelists there, I'd say to you, what can we do to show our support for the water protectors? And maybe, maybe uh, uh, Tom, would you like to perhaps start that and we'll go down the panel this time and then as we go to other questions, we'll individualize it as we go forward in there. But this is one for each one of the panelists. Well, I think part of my presentation didn't really spell it out, but we kind of look at there's a, there's a multi-prong approach there's different levels of what uh, not only you could do to support the protection of water. And then there's the protection of the water protectors that stood there, whether it's backwater bridge, 
Many of you don't know the terminology of that location along that highway, or whether it's another location of standing on the line of people that were harassed, intimidated, criminalized. There's different levels here. Um, and so I try to, for myself, look at the bigger picture. Is It's part of a systems change that created this situation that the world saw. Somehow the narrative and the meme around Mini Wachoni went throughout the world. When I was in Brasilia talking to indigenous leaders that were brought together from different parts of the, of the world, including the indigenous peoples there that were fighting the fight in the Belamonte Dam, Chief Waroni, he stood on the front line and he was there. He stood on the front line. He understood what was going on in the north. And we talked about what needs to be done. And we talked about this concept of systems change. Chase mentioned it about the system is not working. But what is it of the system that is not working? I've been involved with climate change and I've used that term, system change, not climate change. And it's true that one of the articulations that we left uh, out of the Cochabamba gathering in two, April 2010, where there was indigenous peoples, there were farmers, peasants, La Via Campesina, there were women groups, there were workers, youth, and some governmental leaders. And that articulation that came out of there was that the root cause of climate change is capitalism. So as we look here in the north, there's a, there's a difficulty when we talk, when I talk about capitalism. Chase mentioned capitalism. In America, we live in the belly of the beast. So, when we talk about systems change related to an economic system that's based upon extractivism, that's based upon its addiction to fossil fuels, the challenge is how do we move away as American people away from a fossil fuel economy, away from an extractive economy, to what kind of economy then? Do, how do we move towards a living economy? And those criteria and concepts of the economy that indigenous peoples are asking that we embrace based upon values, based upon ethics, indigenous worldview. Like I briefly said, there's a conflict in our understanding of cosmology between the settlers or the colonists and indigenous peoples. We never looked on the same page. There was a separation. So here we are, because laws were developed, and it all ties to water policy and water management. Water systems that don't recognize what, what the Standing Rock Sioux Tribe went on the line to defend the mini, the mini Wichoni. Even understanding what that means and how do, we, how do we even define what that word means so that you will understand what that water of life means. So I think it's multi-pronged. I mean, there's, there's a piece about don't forget the water protectors. And there's a movement of water protectors throughout North America and throughout the world. And then there's things related to policy work, which is long-term. And where do we start to make a change? Thank you. Terry, yep. Sure. Um, so I'm coming directly from a resistance camp, uh, the one that I showed the video of out in Minnesota. Um, if you would like to help with that or get more interested, or you are interested and want to learn more information about it, please visit stopline3.org. 
um, to learn more about this massive tar sands line that's potentially threatening, well, it is threatening a fifth of the world's fresh water. Um, another fight that I think is really important and one that's happening right now is the fight against Kinder Morgan. Um, there are tiny homes being constructed along the pipeline route, another tar sands line. Um, you know, the Trudeau administration, unfortunately, is still continuing this, this uh, policy of subsidizing and supporting the extraction of tar sands in Canada. That is the dirtiest fossil fuel in the world and it needs to change. Um, so, like I said, stopline3.org. Another one um, that I think is more of a something you can do, a lot of people are like, okay, I can't go out to Minnesota, I can't go out to North Dakota, I can't go to British Columbia, what can I do? Um, you know, you can certainly organize in your communities about, you know, divesting and pushing your banks and your city councils to pull their money out of the banks that fund these projects. Um, you know, all of this organizing that we did, it's really, it's, anyone can do this. Anyone can show up at a city council meeting and demand to know where your pension fund is invested. Anyone can go to your own bank and say, you know, is this bank, let me look, let me look online, oh, this bank is funding a tar sands project that's impacting an indigenous community, or oh, this, this bank is funding a, pro a project that's impacting my own state, or whatever it happens to be. You know, there's ways to find these, these things out, and the financial industry is listening, big time. Um, you know, a delegation of indigenous women, I was part of two of them that went out and met with the Norwegian oil fund. It's the third largest funder of fossil fuels in the world. Um, One trillion dollars. That's the size of that fund. They just announced yesterday they're thinking about divesting from fossil fuels entirely. I mean, that's amazing, incredible change. Um, crazy. Yeah, it's crazy, right? It was really fun watching their stocks drop in Europe, you know, that was a great moment. Um, and that's the work of decades of people, decades of organizers doing this work, but it's really got a lot of momentum because of the resistance that happened at Standing Rock, the resistance that's happening around the world with indigenous people. And another one I think that people, you know, it might be, it, it might not seem like it's directly in line with environmental justice and environmental rights, but it is. Um, when your elected officials are running for office or when they're up for re-election or just if they're already in office, ask them when budget appropriations are happening if they're fully, fully fulfilling their duties to indigenous peoples, if they're upholding treaty rights, if they're actually doing those things. Um, I consistently, when I was out in Washington, D.C., representing uh, tribal nations on the Hill, would watch elected officials appropriate budgets to indigenous people that were grossly, grossly underfunded. You guys are the School of Public Health. I'm sure you're aware or at least have heard of the, the Indian Health Service System. It is appalling some of the conditions that our people are seeking medicine and seeking help from. It's, it's unacceptable and those are treaty obligations that the country signed with tribal nations. So ask them. You know, you, you have authority. These people need your votes to be in office, so please consider that also as something you can do that can really impact people. And also, please, please, please tell people that, yes, the Washington football team is really offensive. It really, really is. That's a basic dehumanizing thing. Those things do matter. It's not just me being offended. It is the fact that that is a dehumanizing aspect that then translates to me going up on Capitol Hill and being, and being told that, well, tribes can't really manage their own affairs. I mean, you know, we're, we're, we, I feel you, but you know, I don't really know that you guys have the infrastructure in place. I mean, they essentially think that we're uncivilized. And a lot of that racist imagery perpetuates that notion. So that's all I gotta say. Thanks. Kalina. I'll just add, in addition to all of these other important points, um, that I think there's a lot of power in our own personal networks. So thinking about who's in them, first of all, getting educated about some of these issues um, and seeking out the knowledge, talking to people, but then how can you then begin to get other people engaged and how can you spread that information to other people in your networks in that you just never know who who you'll talk to and who may have a connection to whom and, and how that can possibly um, help support some of the work that everyone at this table is doing and, and that I think there's a lot of resources that are needed in various capacities, whether it's through media, through funding, through um, services, through direct like on the ground action. Um, so I think really for me those two um, points and also just being conscious of, of what kind of ally you are um, as, as a non-native person. Specifically, we need allies and it, that's important, but it's also very important to be um, respectful and understand what that means and what that role is. Thank you. Uh, those, those are very good. I would uh, 
see. The, one of the most powerful things you can do, I think, is to start, you know, treating this, this country here as your homeland. As for everyone listening, because see, original nations have, have a lot of years on what is now called Canada in America. And we treat this as our homeland because it is. We don't have another one. There's a, there's a pipeline running through the only river that we drink water from because people don't see this as their homeland. They don't cherish it, they don't love it. They see it as an it. So the land has loved us for time immemorial, untold millennia. And I think that's a big step for people just whether it's to, 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 it's so hard to do, it's hard to greet the red day. They say this, the, when, the, when the sun, before the sun rises, it's red and that's a holy time that you're supposed to get up and, and greet that. But I only do it during ceremony. I'm kind of, I'm just lazy like that. But that's something that you can do. Another thing you could do is pray with water or put out food to say thanks before you eat it. Like those are very real things that we should be doing as a civilization to promote compassion and just more just living. So I just, I don't want to be your life coach. <laughs> <laughs> but I would say, you know, look us up online as well. Pay attention to the work we're doing because everybody up here is like, they're giving it their all. Fre fresh out of, criminal charges or traveling from, from you know, country to country, state to state, all that, all that we're, we're, they're doing important work and, and so are you and find a way to support that. Moving your capital is probably the easiest, one of the most important ways you can do that. I mean, they, they've talked enough about it. Uh, thank you. Great, thank you. Kalak, Kalak. Yes. Um, I was thinking when people were talking, I just got back from Bonn, Germany at the COP23, Conference of the Party 23. And this past Monday, we heard a presentation by the White House. Uh, Trump sent a delegation to talk about the climate policy, energy policy. And the new policy of the United States that he's gonna be pushing is coal, more coal. Uh, nuclear power and natural gas. And natural gas is specifically liquid uh, natural gas terminal and also hydrofracking. All three of those use water. So if you want to know what you can do, you need to resist that. You need to organize. You need to organize from city to city state by state, unless you're for it. If you say you're, water, you're down for water is life, then there's a contradiction. Is that every one of those abuses, what we've been talking about, is that relationship to the sacredness of water. And the other piece is challenge yourself on how you define energy democracy and what that means and our addiction as United States to the consumption. We take it for granted, we turn on electricity. So that's something that you could do. As I said briefly, energy production depends on water. In 2002, when I was at the UN World, Sum World Summit on Sustainable Development, um, there was a, a senior person there who was a translator, retiring, He's, he's translated in the Security Council of the governments of the world. And our indigenous delegation from throughout the world was really strong at that time. And he was impressed and he pulled me aside when everyone had left and he said, continue to do what you all are doing. And he said, there's two issues that the governments of the world in the Security Council are talking about, two issues. And it involves not only national security, but global security. And he said, do you know what those two issues are? I said, no, I suspect it. But it was water and energy. Those are the two big issues in the next 
decades, next 50 years, 100 years, but right now, we're seeing it. Water, we're running out of water. The fossil aquifers, fossil aquifers, if you don't know, are aquifers that don't recharge. We're losing our water here in the United States, parts of Canada, but throughout the world. And there's gonna be warfare over water. That's what he predicted. Warfare over water. Water is life. So we are in dire straits. And that's where we do need something different in the way we manage water. So that we don't have these situations coming again where we have to demand our rights and stand on the front line. And you need to start stand on the front line of your own government, your own local jurisdiction about the way we treat water, but also the way we define uh, energy democracy, our food sovereignty, and all the other cross-cutting issues. Thank you. So I'm also conscious of time and that we probably have several questions to get to. And the next one is somewhat related. It's what do you see as a role for us as environmental health and public health practitioners to get involved, both as an institution or as individuals? And I'd like to, to briefly make this as to the institutional level. In a, uh, Kaylina, as our most recently minted graduate, um, <laughs> perhaps you could take this one on with respect to the role that an institution can play, and then we'll go to perhaps some other questions too to, to get a broader depth of, of the series of questions, but mm -hmm. please. Sure. Um, well, I feel like there's a number of things. Um, well, one is supporting Native students. Um, I had the honor of receiving a scholarship that allowed me to go to school. Um, and I think having that diversity of knowledge is essential, both for faculty and for other students. So, um, and then I also think I'm, Terry, you may have more to say on this, but divestment, I mean, thinking about how the school is investing their money uh, is has been a hot issue. Um, I know at, at the school I did went to undergrad, uh, they, had a huge divestment um, protest and movement, and I think there's a lot. I think there's a lot, a lot of ways that students can mobilize in in ways that, you know, as a professional is a, a bit more difficult. So, and I think, I think thirdly is, is looking at the, the, the knowledge of, of which we're teaching. What what are we teaching students um, as an institution uh, and you know, how can we include different ways of systems thinking? How can we include more about, you know, indigenous perspective? How can we look at, you know, diversity and race issues? Um, I think a, a lot of it comes down, uh, down to that, really. You know, we're teaching people, we're teaching young people, and what they're learning is gonna be carried on through through the rest of their lives. So the fundamentals of that need to be challenged and we need to look at curriculum as well. You know, what, what, are, what are our kids learning and what do we want them to take away as future leaders? Um, so, yeah, I think those are the two points. Great, thank you. So the next question is, describe synergies between indigenous governments on mainland Alaska and Pacific Islands and the indigenous people of Puerto Rico. What do you see as related struggles experienced by all regions in there? So again, perhaps we can um, focus in on, on um, uh, Tar, do you want to take a? Uh, sure, sure. Um, I would actually add one thing too to the last question. Um, well, two things. First, there is a letter being drafted already. Um, I was reached out to by Rose Weeks, who organized this, um, about drafting a letter to the you know, to Johns Hopkins about divesting. So please support that. Um, as students, you guys have a lot of agency. You're the ones that pay tuition to go here. Um, they do listen to you, and they really don't like it when you're upsetting them in a way that's exposing them for funding fossil fuels. Um, secondly, as far as like what you can do as a public health student, another thing that I, th that I think is really, really cool is using your internships in a way that can maybe affect some of these projects. So, you know, for instance, a lot of what we do at Honor the Earth, um, part of it is fighting pipelines is this regulatory process. So engaging with the Public Utility Commission, engaging with their environmental impact statement or their environmental assessment, and looking at what are the health impacts? What are you studying? Um, you know, what, in, our, in our EIS, we see the tribal resources section 
motion, they put all of our concerns under one paragraph and put the rest of it into the appendix um, and basically just said, yeah, we get it, your, your communities are really at risk and you don't like pipelines, next. You know, that was the, that was the, health, that was the health assessment. Um, so you guys with your brilliant minds, I'm sure could add a lot more to something like that if you wanted to do a research project or an internship. Um, as far as what I see around the world, it's amazing to me to sit in spaces with a whole room of indigenous people that all speak different languages, have different cultures, have different regalia, um, different, you know, everything. Um, but at the, the core issues are our resources are being extracted, our resources are being, you know, taken from us, um, our culture is at risk, our language has been, you know, devastated, but we're still fighting and we're still trying to do these things. Um, but it's been incredible to see the solidarity around the world too. So some of this divestment that keeps coming up, um, it was the Sami people, indigenous people in Norway who started this conversation with the Norwegian Oil Fund. They were the ones that really pushed DNB Bank initially and then we came out and met with them and then the day before we met with them, they divested, which is pretty funny, right? I think they wanted to not have that meeting with us. Um, so yeah, I think you, know, you, you see these common threads and you see also the common threads of a basically a system of justice or injustice that's founded on principles of, in the United States, slavery and genocide, but around the world it's these same structural racism um, systems of law that really just write out indigenous rights generally, and it's really, really, really difficult to navigate within those systems. Um, you know, I think it's very important to seek change, but I think it's also important to look to ourselves to either change those systems or break those systems when they don't work. Thank you. So this is from a uh, specific individual. Has lobbying been done with political leaders within the affected states? And also could a national survey of Congress representatives shame them into taking action? <laughs> so Chase, do you want to take a stab at this one? <laughs> Hey, how did, how did this guy's question get in? This is the great <laughs> Santosham. I remember that name. How's it going? <laughs> yeah, that means he's watching. Um, there, there has been uh, some lobbying, but I think that um, every, every day, you know, none of us could have expected what we got with Trump. You know, I'll, I'll admit that the sky was falling when Trump was first elected. Then it was okay. Now it seems like the sky is falling again. So we need to have a, a sense of urgency, I think, with respect to who's uh, leading our country, who does Trump really represent, and who, who should any president ever really represent? Should it be the corporate state or, or, or the expressions in, in the, the flex of corporate personhood, which we know, you know, law and order, it serves corporate personhood, it serves capital, it serves uh, property, and it should serve people. It should serve rivers, it should serve what, what we call ancient sovereign, what other people might call animals. The four-legged, the winged, the things that swim and crawl and so forth that predate our claims to any kind of right to be here on Mother Earth. That's really what we've, we've got to do in it just, I was thinking about what could we really do? You know what I think we could really do? We could all pull a Jim Carrey. We could deconstruct our self, our ego. We could deconstruct our identities, look very, very honestly within, go a little crazy, <laughs> and be the better for it, I think, because we don't have time. We do not have any time left. There's no, there's no more time for, you know, beating around the bush, so to speak. So I, I just want to say that much. Excellent. Thank you. I'd also, I'd want to add one thing, which is don't always look to the top either. Your local governments and your local states are so important. Um, you know, a lot of the traction that we're seeing obviously is not with the Donald Trump administration when we're fighting pipelines and his MO is telling tribal leaders that they should just extract and once it's out of the ground, there's really nothing that anyone can do about it. That's his advice is to break the law. That's what he's been telling tribes um, because he knows that tribes have so many resources that are sitting under the ground because we don't extract them. Um, I mean, some of us do, but not all of us. 
Um, but no, the, with the states, you know, the states are, you know, they're very powerful in the terms of you having say as a citizen and you saying, hey, you need my vote to be in office. I don't support this project. I don't support this, this, this uh, continued fossil fuel extraction. I want to see renewable energies in my state. I want to see a massive input and move in this state towards just transition. I want that to happen. I want real energy solutions. I don't want fossil fuels from another country or fossil fuels from the Bakken or wherever coming through my backyard and threatening my children's futures. I want to have energy independence and I want it to be green and I want it to be clean. Great, thank you. And I'm conscious of time, so this is going to be our last question here that we have that's coming up in real time for me as well. It seems like such a daunting number of pipeline projects going on. How do you prioritize, replenish yourselves, and let your energies keep going? So again, I think this actually is one that we could have go through the, through the panel session, and um, each one of you perhaps gives some thoughts on this, and it'd also be kind of a summary thought as well as you put this into that context, please. It's great. Oh, wow. True, there's a lot of pipelines, and we try to look at where, where the oil comes from or where the natural gas comes from on those pipelines, and that's something we have to always uh, remind people. Um, here we are with the uh, Nebraska Public Utilities uh, Commission approving the, the, the Keystone XL pipeline, the Upper Prairie Line portion. TransCanada is the corporation. Um, but people still don't know where that oil comes from. It comes from Canada. It comes from at the expense of the Northern Dene and uh, um, the Cree and the Métis. Um, and if you just Google search, you will find how devastating that industrial complex is. And I've been fortunate to be around the world in the tar sands in northern Alberta, Canada. is one of the largest industrial complexes that I have ever seen. It's devastating. And to just look at the international agreement that, they, that we have as United States with Canada on energy policy, it's, 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 it's shameful. And so that comes back to the responsibility that we have to educate ourselves. There was mention the Kinder Morgan pipeline. Justin Trudeau, you know, is making no effort, even though he talks double talk, saying he, you know, that he recognizes First Nation and and Aboriginal rights. He doesn't, you know, when you look at him going forward with the Kinder Morgan pipeline, and the oil that flows through there comes from the tar sands, the resistance there. And then you look at all the other pipelines. You're talking about a fossil fuel, uh, fossil fuel system. You're talking about energy policy and climate policy of this country and the cross-cutting issue, issue with water, water policy. So it's something that isn't just the pipeline. And you need to look deeper within that. And how do we prioritize? And prioritizing takes a lot of work and building networks and alliances and coalitions uh, on a divestment campaign. There's a coalition that's native base. There's non-native people doing divestment as well. And how do we work all together on pipeline issues? And I believe that all the people that I know of, everyone's doing everything they can to be strategic and how we use our resources. And those resources isn't just financial, it's resources of volunteerism, people just going out to the, on the line. But it's also challenging the big white environmental organizations too because environmental racism does exist there. And being able to empower and develop the capacity of frontline communities and native organizations doing the work. And that's part of this challenge that we have, that there's people that are able to go to Europe as part of that investment campaign. Next year is a World Water Forum. It's gonna be in Brasilia, uh, 
Brasilia, Brazil, the World Water Forum. And there's going to be a need for indigenous peoples to be there, to be articulate and strategic in what we are campaigning for with the world ministers, confronting them on these same issues. And the United States is going to be there. And they're going to be doing lip service on this other end. So there's different strategies around this issue of water's life. Uh, so part of the reason why I'm currently focusing and have been for the last few years focusing energies on line three is because it's my people's territory. Um, it's a Anishinaabe territory at stake and it's the heart of our culture. It is wild rice beds that this pipeline passes through that this pipeline would, would obliterate when it leaks. Um, but it's also strategic. It's Enbridge's single largest project in history. Enbridge is the largest pipeline company in the world. It's hard to go after pipeline, after pipeline, after pipeline. It's exhausting. But when you cripple the infrastructure and you cripple the industry, you're looking at the source. My eyes are always at the source and what's happening up in Alberta, what's happening in the Bakken, these places that are essentially sacrifice zones. They've been treated as sacrifice zones, as if their lives don't matter. Um, looking at you know the frontier mine, the tech mine expansion that wants to ex expand the tar sands even further than they already are, it's a crater in the earth you can see from space. Um, you know what keeps me energized when you are fighting these campaigns and you are, you know, in the instance of Line Three, a group of not even 30 people fighting a multi-billion-dollar industry, it's exhausting. It really is, and it's hard to go out there and know, I've already got a couple of arrests. You know, I've got to keep trying and keep doing this because it's so important. And I can't think about, I just, I can't think about this, um, you know, oppressive state that's coming down, but that, that is a reality. You know, it is a reality that you can only get arrested so many times, right? Um, but what keeps me energized and what keeps me going is spending time with children. Um, when I was out at Dakota Access, I, got, I was fortunate enough to hang around Chase's kids, and they're amazing and beautiful. And being around them is just this breath of fresh air knowing this is who I'm doing it for. This is why it's so important um, to see those faces and to know I'm, I'm fighting for your future, and I, I want you to have a future. I want you to have a better future than I have. So that's how I keep going. Oh. I want to follow that too by um, sharing one of our teachings that we have is based on the understanding that every decision that we make is based on that seventh generation. So we don't look just to the next, to our children, but to their children, to their children. So it's, it's the, the format by which we think about how we treat things. And I think part of where the motivation to keep in this line of work is really understanding that there's such a source of beauty in these places connected to all of the foods that come from the water, that come from the land. And in that beauty and in that culture is the drive to keep, to know that that's gonna continue on and that these are important ways of understanding and knowing if we're gonna continue to survive on, on Earth, this changing planet, and to continue to adapt. Um, I think acknowledging and, and um, yeah, acknowledging all of the work that you all do, I'm, I'm just so thankful to, and thankful for you all for listening and, and for being here. Yeah. Anyway. Thank you. Um, wait, what was the question? You guys answered everything. <laughs> how, do, how do you prioritize, uh, let me just add a very quick thing, because I think that we are all searching for a purpose. We know that we have a purpose. We're all on a path of spiritual Theme. evolution. Uh, we are all on the path of spiritual liberation, kind of, kind of stepping out of, of the dark ages, of the confines of human constructs like race, religion, and so forth, and then going even deeper to those that we were born into, like our phenotypes or our languages or what have you, and we're, we're constantly liberating and uniting. So for, for me, I feel that we have a duty to share purpose. I know that when you hear us speak, you can, you can tell that we've been there, because it changes you, it really, really does. But that change belongs to everyone. 
Everybody has to get there somehow, and however you can, with whatever tools you can, you should be helping, because this is your homeland, and we only get one planet. I know I'm preaching to the choir here, but I'm, I'm directing my message to, to everybody listening. We have to stay engaged right now. If we don't continue to show up, there, there will be fascism right now in this country if it already isn't here and it already doesn't have a stranglehold. Our, our democracy, all that stuff has been completely hijacked. It's, it's out of our hands and the only way to take it back is if we stand up. They, we have to stand up and they, they not allow them to walk right over us. We have that power. So. I don't really, I don't have a choice but, but to stay driven. You know what I mean? I just, that's just how it is. That's our walk, that's our way. And it's, it's all of our walk in our way. So thank you. Wow, thank you. I'd like. <laughs> this, this does conclude the question and answer um, part. I'd really like, let's give a big round of applause to our panel. so much and thank you for for the time and the energy that you put in here I have a few kind of logistics that are going to be part of this it's that you have a voice you heard that and you need to use it and everyone can take action today so what we're going to do next is two things first I'm going to tell you about a reception and action fair that's going to occur in the Finestone Hall just a few doors down here where that you can learn about how to take action locally, globally, you can write down an action you will take. And then you can take a photo of that to hold you somewhat accountable to writing down that action. Post it online. And then you can post it on social media to hold you even more accountable <laughs> as part of that, as we all need to put skin in this game. I learned so much and it gave me a unique perspective of, of how humbling it is for me to be able to be here listening to those that have that experience that I want to learn from them. And what I'd like us to do now is that we're gonna invite uh, Tom Goldtooth to have us in a, a closing prayer after which we will then go to the Feinstone Hall. So Tom. How'd you know I was gonna ask you to stand? I was gonna have you sit. <laughs> um, I, as you heard uh, from the speakers, um, it's very critical that we reevaluate what our relationship is to the sacredness of Mother Earth. I've said this numerous times to many different people. But also it's understanding that creative principle, that female creative principle of our relationship to Mother Earth that includes Father Sky. The creative principle we talk about, that cosmovision, however we define that and translate that in our own languages is part of the natural laws. Then our own natural laws, not the natural laws of the colonial legal system and that relationship that, that humanity is in search of is very important. That landing, that place to where you go to understand what we are saying. And I want to acknowledge the, the three there. They're brave to be able to talk about traditional knowledge. I'm very cautious to talk about traditional knowledge and share that. I just came from, like I said, from the UNFCCC. Jokingly, we spun our own narrative, the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. We changed it to United Nations Framework, uh, Framework Convention on Climate Capitalism uh, because 
one of the main mitigation that they're proposing to implement state, na nation by nation is trading mechanisms where we trade nature. And now we're trading water. Maud Barlow, very well recognized non-native woman from Canada, a lawyer with the Council of Canadians, talks about this. She was with us about the trading of water. You can damage water here, but you can offset your damage by restoring water you damaged over here. Compensation. Payment for ecological services. Nature is capital. Carbon trading, cap and trade. Carbon pricing. Put in a price to atmosphere. Conservation offsets. In Canada, they already inventory biodiversity and conservation in Manitoba and Saskatchewan. We're entering that realm of what's been talked about. It's where we are going in our values, in our ethics as people, in our relationship to that sacredness of Mother Earth is very critical. That relationship to the water of, of, of life. The water of life for those of you who have given birth, the passing of water, the passing of water and the gift of life from that passing of water. How do we translate that? Mini wachuni. That true meaning, it's a gift of expression of the consciousness of water. I'm gonna sing this song that my teacher, my grandpa, Pitaha Yuhamani, P. Kachis, P. Kachis Sr. He's my grandpa, but more like my dad. He passed away in 1993. I've been with him for 20 some years. And we had a Sundance in Chase's territories, the Sitting Bull Sundance, when they brought him a Chanduhupa to bring back these teachings, the Buffalo Way. One cannot convey the teachings of all the children. The chairman, that's no longer a chairman, Dave Arshambo Jr., his family comes from that camp. The teachings, the teachings are very important. So this song is one of those songs it reminds us of who we are. It reminds us of where we're going. It reminds us where we are at this time of going forward. We're all vulnerable. We're all at a place to where, in our humbleness, we look for answers. We hope that what we're doing is good work. We hope that what we're doing is being recognized by the Creator. We all wish for that in your own way. So in this short time that we've heard these stories and communication of water of life, this song represents that and much more. Imagine yourself throwing out like you're fishing. You're throwing out, you're casting out that, that line way far away. And you're waiting. You're waiting and leaning forward with your ears, wanting a response. Am I being heard? Am I being heard by that sacred place? Am I being heard? And in response, that voice says, yes, you're doing good. You're doing good and carry on these teachings of who you are. So that's where we are, that transformation. We're all in a transforma transformation time, a, tr a, a transition. Oh, 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 oh. 